the types of attacks that we're concerned about is no longer in this in this domain is no longer that of the hacker we're more concerned about the intruder the actual physical intrusion rather than the electronic intrusion this is a pretty good list of the types of threats that we need to be concerned about in physical security our concerns should be the protection of, uh, from physical damage theft of our assets interruption of our services the unauthorized disclosure of information natural disasters, fire, vandalism, terrorism, and environmental issues. This is just a subset of the types of threats that we're concerned with, and we need to implement countermeasures to protect against. 9-11 should be a wake-up call that uh, these security programs really need to be in place now and need to be in force all the time. New Orleans is another example where physical security planning should be in place and be maintained on a regular basis. It doesn't require a huge catastrophe for our physical security planning to be implemented and to be effective. It could be a much smaller type of disaster than either of the two we just looked at. As I indicated earlier, the electronic attack is one form of attack that we dealt with in networking and telecom, and several of the other domains. In this domain, we're more concerned about physical loss. This would be loss due to theft, vandalism, fire, things along these lines. In these examples on the slide, we see numerous, uh, numerous losses due to theft or vandalism or negligence on the, behalf of, on the part of the employees. It should go without saying that always, always, always human safety is our top priority. We first protect human safety. After that, we start to implement our physical security programs and start to address the protection of property. But always, human safety comes first. These days, if we haven't implemented proper physical security, we are already negligent. And in the case of any sort of injury or accident, we will probably be found liable. What this says is we need to get the physical security plan, program, and awareness training in place as quickly as possible because, again, if it's not there already, we are already negligent and probably liable for any mishaps. We need to pull together a team which generally should represent each major faction or department in the organization because they know where their physical security threats are most prevalent. They know what they need to protect and I need their information to pull together the overall cohesive plan to help protect the entire organization. The goals of a physical security program should include these five major topics. Our first objective is to deter the attacker, convince them not to attack. If they do attack, the second goal says delay them, slow them down. The longer it takes them to implement their attack, the more likely they'll change their minds or the more likely they'll be detected and will be able to respond. So goal one is deter them, convince them not to do this. Second, if they do do it, cause them some delay, as much delay as possible. The third goal is detection. If they are going to attack, I'll slow them down so that I can increase the likelihood of detection. Now, if once I detect, I will then, goal number four, assess the situation. And step five is to respond. So deter, delay, detect, assess, and then respond. These are the five primary goals of the physical security program. The physical security program should have metrics established so that I can qualify exactly how well the security program is performing. I should have a before and after set of statistics on things such as the number of successful crimes or disruptions, the number of unsuccessful crimes or disruptions, things along these lines. So look through this list and understand that these are the types of metrics that we can implement so that we can qualify how successful our security program is. So again, taking a look at the big picture, we'll pull together a team 
from the major factions of the organization because they know where the threats are in their particular areas. We'll perform a risk analysis to identify where the vulnerabilities are and what the business impact of each of these threats on those uh, valuable information assets are. We will then begin to identify the acceptable risk level. Now this is done jointly with senior management. This is not the, the objective or the, the responsibility of the security team. Senior management will always identify the acceptable risk level. We'll simply identify to them where we see risks and then we'll implement or we'll propose countermeasures that will reduce that risk to hopefully a level management will find acceptable. We then will identify baselines, in, in other words, the minimum level of security. A breach of this baseline triggers an incident and an, an investigation. So these baselines say this is what we expect as a, a minimum level of security for our organization. And then finally, we build the metrics so that we can measure the effectiveness of our physical security program. To summarize, the goals of the physical security program are to deter the attack, delay the attack, detect the attack, assess the attack, and then respond to the attack. We should implement countermeasures for each of these areas so that we can increase our physical security for the facility. We perform risk analysis to help bring the risk to an acceptable level. Remember, acceptable level of risk is defined by senior management. We simply tell them or advise them where we think we can get it if we implement the appropriate countermeasures. This identifies then a physical security baseline so that we can identify what exactly is an incident, what is an infraction of our physical security. And from there we will implement countermeasures to maintain that security baseline. To implement physical security deterrence types of countermeasures, we'll use fences, warning signs, security guards, and guard dogs. These are deterrence because the attacker sees these physical security components, these countermeasures that we have in place, and they are deterred from actually ever initiating the attack. The goal of a deterrent is to stop the attack before it starts. So the four areas where you can improve the deterrence relative to physical security are to increase the effort required to commit the crime. This means make it more difficult for the bad guy to actually violate the physical security of your organization. Increase the risk associated with the crime. In other words, make sure the guy understands he's probably going to get caught. We would do this with uh, uh, surveillance and um, a well-trained well -trained, uh, security guard staff, things along these lines. We would also then reduce the rewards of the crime. In other words, convince the bad guy there are no juicy targets here. There's nothing great for you to steal here, so just leave us alone. And finally, remove the excuses. If a guy says, well, gee, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to go in there, this is because you didn't have signs up. This is warning uh, private property, uh, trespassers will be prosecuted. So these are four branches of deterrence that you can implement to help reduce the likelihood that a crime will occur. The second part of this is delay, delay the attack. We delay the attack with implementation of locks and fences and layered physical security. This is an example of another approach to delaying attacks. It's, I'll, I'll leave it at this. So these layers should all work together. They should be tiered, uh, they should be integrated. Usually though they require a security guard to actually perform the response to this uh, delay approach. The point of delaying the attack is so that we can increase the likelihood of detection, assessment, and then reaction. And the reaction of course is usually uh, some form of security guard or police response. We have physical security delay mechanisms, and then we have administrative types of delay mechanisms. And again, we use these in combination, as you see in this slide. All these combinations, these factors working together to improve the physical security of our facilities. The third step is detection. First I deter, then I delay, and if they still are coming, I need to be able to detect them. 
So we need to be concerned about detecting physical penetration from outside to the inside and also what happens if the bad guy is already inside. So I need these intrusion detection systems both externally and internally. The next step is assessment. Once I identify that a physical threat is actually taking place right now, I need to identify exactly what the nature of this threat is and then trigger a response. The response could be the contacting of police or fire or medical personnel. The response could be uh, let the guard dogs loose. The response could be uh, grab a fire extinguisher and go put out the fire. We don't always need to elevate to the highest possible level and this is the conditioned response that the security guard can implement. Any one of these areas, deter, detect, assess, respond, any one of these areas that are weak can allow the attack to succeed. All it takes is one weak link in the chain. This again addresses the need for a layered security approach. And this is a, an example of all the different factions and layers that we might implement as countermeasures to help protect the physical security of our facility. Again, an example of the layered approach, the various areas where we need to implement security and the various countermeasures we might implement regarding those uh, security uh, objectives. In this next section, we're going to look at these topics. The first one is crime prevention, and more specifically, it's crime prevention through the use of environmental design. Next, we're going to look at facility construction, entrance protection, and then perimeter security. Let's take a quick look at the different types of threats that we might have to deal with natural environmental types of threats. These are storms, earthquakes, things along these lines, uh, uh, ice storms, etc. So these are natural types of threats. If our supply system gets shut down, whether that's uh, delivery of, of our raw materials, whether that is uh, a failure on our electrical systems, even things such as uh, gas to heat the facility, these types of uh, supply system failures can actually disrupt your facility. We have man-made threats. This would be vandalism, this would, could be theft, this could be um, uh, disgruntled employees. So these are another form of threat. And finally we have political types of threats such as riot and civil disobedience. We need to implement physical security countermeasures to protect against all of these types of threats. Again, let's take a look at this crime prevention through environmental design. This is the physical construction of our environment that tends to deter a crime from taking place. If we have good lighting, good visibility, it is less likely that a criminal will actually take action. The whole point of this is to understand this relationship between the way a criminal will behave relative to their specific physical environment. Again, they want to be stealthy. If it's well lit, high visibility, likely that they'll be seen, it's very likely they will not commit the crime. Here are some examples of how we might design an environment to minimize crime. First we see on the left that there might be the casual bypasser that could observe a crime taking place. The area is well lit, so the more public the place, the more visible the environment, the more well lit the environment, the less likely a crime will be committed here. With this in mind, here are some examples of how we might design our, our environment to implement this crime prevention through environmental design. Keep the hedges and shrubbery low enough that a bad guy can't hide behind them. If there are people in the area, a criminal is less likely to commit the crime because of so many witnesses around and they might even stop him from committing the crime. Good visibility, good lines of sight, and again this requires good illumination uh, and even boundaries. We see this, uh, the term lights and bollards down below. Bollards are boundaries that are placed along walkways to identify public areas and private areas. If we have physical access control, such as the double door here, a 
criminal now realizes this is going to slow him down. This is a delay tactic. This is going to slow him down as he makes his escape. So the, the criminal is less likely to commit the crime in an area designed like this. Natural surveillance. Create wide open spaces as you're building your facilities or as you're designing your facilities. Again, this increases visibility and it makes it less likely that a criminal will feel comfortable uh, in committing his crime. It's more likely he'll be detected. Territorial reinforcement, again, bollards, fences, uh, boundaries. What we want to do is present visible boundaries uh, that identify where public turf is and where private turf is so that the bad guys will know when they're violating uh, the private territory. Here's a great example of that concept. Another aspect of this is target hardening. In other words, make it difficult for the bad guy to get to the area of uh, uh, intended crime where the theft might be taking place or the crime might be taking place. Make it difficult for him to get there. Again, this is a delay tactic. Uh, this also is a deterrent. If they see large fences, if they see uh, large locks, things along these lines, if there's signage that says uh, warning this premises is, uh, uses a, an alarm system, you will delay or deter the attack. So we want to harden the targets and make those, that hardening visible to the attacker. Now, natural boundaries such as rivers, cliffs, hills, things along these lines uh, also tend to impede an attacker. If he doesn't have many ways to escape, he will feel less confident and may decide not to attack this particular area. Next, we're going to look at facility site selection and facility construction. Regarding site selection, you'll want to consider this list of uh, uh, potential issues. Uh, is the area prone to natural disasters such as flood, hurricane, tornado, or earthquake? If you're going to look for inexpensive property, you might find yourself in a high crime area. We need to consider this as well. This might mean you'll, while you'll save money on, on rent or property costs, you'll spend more money on securing and protecting that facility. Do you need access to trains, airports, and highways? So we'll need physical access to the property. Uh, are you the type of business that, that requires walk-by traffic from customers? or pass by traffic, or do you want to be isolated and hidden from the public? Are you in a strip mall where you might have uh, problems with your tenants, the joint tenants, people uh, adjacent to your property? How close are you to emergency services? And do you want a high visibility business or low visibility? If you require customers, if your business is the, the type that, that caters to customers. You might need drive-by traffic and walk-by traffic. You want high visibility with bright neon signs. However, if you don't require that type of business, that's not where your revenue stream comes from, you might want to keep a very low profile and actually fade into the shrubbery. This uh, latter concept is called urban camouflage. You don't want to be visible. You want to be just another uninteresting building in a huge city of buildings. Nothing attractive, nothing interesting, nothing appealing. Next we'll look at construction of facilities. You need to consider what is the building going to be used for. Are we going to be making bubble gum and candy bars or are we making military weapons and things along these lines? You recognize the construction requirements for those two very different types of businesses require different types of construction. Am I concerned about emanations security? Emanations, of course, are electronic impulses that can be detected from outside the building. So I might want to construct the building that reduces emanations leakage from the facility. If you live, if you live in an area where the facility is located near earthquakes or fault lines, you might need to consider this in the design of your facility. Fire resistance is always an issue regarding the construction, the design and construction of a facility. Light timbers burn in approximately 30 minutes, whereas heavy timbers will, will not burn for up to an hour. So you want to consider these types of things. By the way, local fire code may have some de definition on what the requirements are in your local areas. 
light frame is cheap and easy to construct, goes together quickly, but will burn and collapse much more rapidly. Heavy timbers are substantially more resistant to fire and will support greater weight inside the facility as well. If you have greater load-bearing requirements, you'll need to go to concrete or cinder block with rebar reinforcements. And even the greatest level of reinforcement won't stop all forms of attack. Of course, the concrete is substantially more fire resistant than any type of wood construction. Next, we'll take a look at where we should locate the data center. The data center, of course, is one of the more valuable areas in our corporate environment. So we'll want to protect this from these exterior threats. I never want to put the data center on the lower floors because these are more subject to flooding. And I generally don't want to put them on the higher floors because as if, if the building ever catches on fire, fire always rises. And also, too close to the roof, roofs very often will leak. You want to keep your data center towards the center of the building, usually away from exterior walls. So again, the data center is one of your more valuable areas regarding your information assets. I want to see to it that this is physically secure. Generally, I'll have uh, uh, locks on the door on the data center. I also need to consider the support services required for the data center, and that would be heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and electricity. The walls for the data center should go from floor to true ceiling, not just drop-down ceiling. If we only have a partition between rooms, a bad guy can simply raise the, lift the ceiling panels and climb over the wall and get into your secure data center. So we'll always want to be sure that the data center is surrounded by true walls from floor to true ceiling, not just a drop-down ceiling with a partition in between. We need to consider the weight-bearing requirements and fire resistance of all the construction materials, and that includes floors, walls, and ceilings. We want to see to it that the, if there are windows, that they are small, so small that a person could not come into or go out of that window. And if we have many doors, and sometimes these are required for uh, fire requirements uh, due to the uh, local fire ordinances, I'll see to it that I have controlled entry, one or two controlled entryways. And if I need more doorways for emergency exits, they will be locked from the outside and will have alarmed crash bars on the inside so that they open easily from the inside so someone can escape, but will know about it immediately and can react. This is an example of the types of things you'll consider as you're designing your data center. Now that we've identified where we're going to place our facility and what we're going to construct the facility out of, we need to consider some more details, such as at each entryway, at each, at each uh, uh, entrance, we need to consider what types of doors do we need to place, and we'll also be looking at windows momentarily. We have various strengths of doors and of course the cost goes up with with the stronger and stronger doorways. Let's take a look at some of these now. Probably the least expensive and easiest to implement is a hollow core door. So these are lowest level of security, uh, relatively inexpensive, relatively lightweight, uh, easy to hang, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. These are your typical door for the not too secure area. Next we have solid core doors. These are more expensive, these are heavier, a little more difficult to hang. They also have a higher fire rating than the hollow core door, more resistant to fire. And in extreme cases, we have bulletproof doorways that can be implemented. These are fairly expensive and fairly heavy, but provide the greatest level of security. These also have a higher fire resistance level than any of the other doorways we've seen. We also need to consider the strike plates and the hinges. Generally, you want to keep the hinges either completely hidden or com keep the hinges on the inside of the doorway so that a bad guy can't simply remove the hinges and take the door off the doorway. You'll also need to consider the various types of locks that might need to be implemented on these doors. 
you'll need to consider the direction of traffic, the frequency of traffic, and the level of security required for the environment that the doorway is protecting. Now we'll take a look at the different types of windows that you might implement. And again, these provide higher levels of security, but generally the more security you get with these windows, the more cost there is related to the windows. Many considerations need to be analyzed while we're looking at controlling access to these sensitive areas. We need to consider who needs to get into the area, how often do they need to go to that area, what level of protection on the assets inside that area is required. Uh, things along these lines. Another one that you'll always need to consider are the fire codes. Uh, if you violate local fire code, the fire department can actually close your facility. Uh, this, would, this would be a failure of your physical security plan. So you always need to comply by those codes to the highest level. We also need to protect the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, electrical power, telephone lines, and if we have any monitoring components, we always need to protect the power lines to those monitoring devices as well as the feedback lines from those. Otherwise, a bad guy can simply shut down the power to your detective devices and he'll go undetected. We need to analyze what areas are sensitive. Any area that uh, has access to electrical power service, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, these need to be protected. Any area where our telephone systems and data lines are available for access, these also need to be protected. Where our surveillance and monitoring equipment is located, must be protected as well, and any of these wiring closets where these systems come together also are sensitive areas and should be protected. We had talked about this a little earlier. Understand the difference between a simple partition that goes from the floor to only the drop-down ceiling, not the true ceiling. These can be climbed over quite easily. If we have a secure room, such as the server room, the data center, we want to be sure that the walls go from the true floor to the true ceiling so that they can't be circumvented by simply climbing over the drop-down ceiling. Within the facility, a map should be made of the security zones within the facility. A map that identifies what areas are requiring the highest level of security, the lowest level of security, what might be public areas, things along these lines. This is an example of such a map. Again, this provides us a clear understanding and allows us to define clear sets of rules and construction types of materials for these various areas. It will also identify the type of monitoring devices we might need to locate in each of these areas. Now that we've identified which areas are the highest level of sensitivity and which areas might have very low levels of sensitivity. We need to understand the types of locks that we've implemented in these areas or should be implementing in these areas. They run from the relatively inexpensive conventional locks to the more expensive electronic combination lock. The electronic combination lock is also referred to as a cipher lock. We need to be concerned about who has keys and how easy it is to duplicate those keys. There should be a log or an inventory of keys that are distributed to the various employees and again it should always go along with administrative policy that these keys should not be duplicated. In some cases you can actually implement locks that require special permission to duplicate the keys. Now that's not necessarily a guarantee that a locksmith won't reproduce this key without authorization but uh, you still need to take the the fullest, uh, the most appropriate steps possible to try and secure the duplication of these keys. Another form of lock that we need to consider is called the smart lock. The smart lock uses either a smart card or a swipe card to uh, provide access to the facility. These are, uh, have the additional benefit of being able to track when people leave and when they come in. So this provides you an audit trail of access. A few details you need to know about lock picking deals with the tools. The three main tools are the tension wrench, the pick, and the rake. These are tools used by bad guys to break your locks or pick your locks. Uh, there are pick resistant locks that make this a uh, much more challenging uh, objective for the, for the bad guy to accomplish. As part of our physical security analysis, we need to understand where the entry points are. 
we need to provide restricted access to those entry points, and generally we want to keep, uh, keep the number of entrances to a minimum. I might have to have many, many doors for fire safety to meet fire code. However, I generally will have a very few number of entrances and many, many other uh, exits, but those are locked from the outside very often even without a, a handle on the outside, but there's a crash panel that is alarmed on the inside to provide those emergency exits to meet that fire code. So we need to consider the primary and secondary entrances. Uh, if there's access from the roof into the facility, this might be another way that a bad guy can get into the building. We need to consider maintenance entrances, uh, emergency exits, and again, as we discussed earlier, windows. Generally what I want to do is keep those windows small enough that a human can't go in or out of those windows. Uh, loading docks, delivery doors, and then, of course, we always have to be considerate to, uh, to provide those areas for smoking. Uh, again, this is very often a problem area because very often people will prop those doors open, uh, even emergency exits, prop those emergency exits open so that they can uh, go smoke out uh, in a more convenient area rather than going to the formal smoking area. In order to identify individuals, to provide access to, we need some form of identification mechanisms. A uh, common approach is a badge with a photo ID and a security guard that should be inspecting those badges. There are biometric devices and then of course smart cards and swipe cards that can be used for identity for access controls. There are wireless proximity devices that detect the presence of uh, an individual attempting to gain access. The user activated is generally a magnetic swipe card, very much like your credit card or the ATM cards. It's just a magnetic tape uh, that has information encoded in that magnetic media. The user must swipe this card through a reader. There's also the system sensing that uses a transponder and electronics actually inside the card that you issue to the individuals. Uh, these are system sensing types of proximity devices. Both of these devices can be used to provide audit trails to identify when individuals enter and exit the facilities. So again, we have the passive devices. Get This is like the magnetic tape on a credit card or an ATM card. And these um, are less expensive and relatively easy to produce. But then we also have field power devices. This is where the card that you issue to the individual actually has electronics embedded in the plastic card. And they get activated when they approach a transponder. This is what we would uh, uh, install near the doorway. The transponder initializes and communicates with the powered card uh, that the user holds. And then they communicate in a wireless fashion. Even if we identify individuals as they enter and exit buildings, we also need to be concerned about piggybacking or tailgating. Piggybacking is when one guy swipes a card and four people walk into the facility. I now have no audit trail regarding the other three individuals. And the thing to remember is that the guy who swipes his card is now responsible for any malicious acts or, or other actions that the in the other three individuals might take. As far as the audit trail is concerned, there's only one individual in the facility at that point in time. So user awareness training is a big part of defeating piggybacking. Man traps are another effective tool against piggybacking. We'll take a look at man traps. Security guards also are very good at this. So here are some examples of man traps. We have the revolving door. We have the turnstiles of uh, different designs. So with a man trap, the individual is authenticated and then enters the man trap. The man trap generally has an entrance and an exit, and only one individual is allowed in the man trap at a time. And this can be, this can be implemented through just reduction of physical space with the revolving door, or this could actually be two adjacent doors where the user swipes his card, walks through door number one, closes door number one, and only after door number one is closed can he unlock door number two with another swipe of his card. Very often these man traps have biometric devices installed to identify a, the weight of the individual 
uh, and maintain that that weight is consistent with what the weight has been historically. This is to defeat the individual from removing property from the facility. Here's an example of a man trap. And again, if there were a weight sensor in the floor, we could identify that there was only one individual in the man trap and that the individual is probably not carrying away one or two computers from the facility. A couple of definitions you'll need to know regarding doors. We have the fail safe configuration and we have a fail secure configuration. Now this implies that if the power fails, what is the state of the door? If we say that the door is fail safe, that means when the power fails, all doors are now unlocked. This is usually a requirement by local fire codes. Fail secure says if the electricity goes away, the door remains locked. Uh, this very often is an unsafe situation. Next, we're going to look at external boundary protection mechanisms. These are physical controls that are placed external to the facility, and they are our first line of defense against an intruder. We're going to look at some locks, fencing, and other physical barriers, security force, outside lighting, intrusion detection systems, and then monitoring devices. And again, our goal here is to stop the bad guy from ever making it to the facility. Let's start with fencing. You should know this table. Uh, the height of the fence has a direct rela relationship with the level of deterrence on penetration. A three to four foot fence will deter the casual trespasser. A six or seven foot fence is too high to easily climb. What this means is if somebody comes over a six or seven foot fence, he has malicious intent. This individual is determined to come into your facility. If you even want to stop that guy, you build an eight foot tall fence with barbed wire on top. This is a severely determined individual. This guy really is a, uh, somebody we want to keep outside. We have powered fences that provide an electric shock. Now generally, this is a secondary fence. I'll put an external fence up that might be six or seven feet high, and then I'll put a second fence that is powered. There should be signage that identifies and warns this is an electrified fence, because this could actually injure an individual and uh, provide a form of liability for your organization. So powered fencing generally is a secondary fence inside an external peripheral fence. The next one we see on the slide is called the PEDIS fencing, perimeter intrusion detection and assessment system. Now PEDIS actually sends a small voltage radio frequency signal through the entire fence and as an intruder might uh, touch the fence, it changes the impedance of the fence, the way that the radio frequency commutes through the fence. This is detectable and signals an alarm. The problem with the PEDIS fences is that there are very high false positives on the PEDIS fence. If a tree branch falls up against the fence or an animal brushes up against the fence, you'll get an alarm. So a lot of false positives on PEDIS fencing. This diagram shows the implementation of a PEDIS fence where the signal detection is inside the lamp post itself but then a cable run, a buried cable run, would go from the lamp post where the detector is to the security guard center. Again, if, the, if an intruder touches the fence, uh, an alarm goes off, security guards now can provide a conditioned response to the perceived threat. The mesh of the fence and the gauge of the wire used on the fence has, an, it has a relationship to the level of security on the fence. The broader the mesh and the smaller the gauge of the wire, uh, the less secure and, of course, the less expensive. The tighter the mesh, in other words, the smaller the openings between the, the wires and the thicker the wire, the more secure the fence is and, of course, the more expensive the fence is. In addition to the uh, mesh and the gauge of the wire, you want to consider, of course, the height of the fence, as we discussed earlier, and putting this top guard of barbed wire on top of the fence. Many issues regarding fencing need to be considered. They require a great deal of maintenance and planning in their construction. So the fences need to be inspected on a regular basis and maintained on a regular basis. Of course, the posts have to be buried deep enough and always secured with concrete so that somebody can't simply just dig out the post and uh, violate the fence. 
Um, we want to be concerned about materials around the fence, a, a tree very close to a fence. A bad guy can climb the tree and jump over the fence. So we want to be sure that there aren't any natural or uh, even, even construction type of uh, uh, objects that might allow someone to uh, evade or, or violate the fence by simply climbing on top of a shed perhaps and jumping over the fence. We'll take a quick look at gating. There's uh, four classes of gates. Everything from a class one being the lowest security level for residential usage all the way through a class four gate which is restricted access and this is one that typically is monitored and uses barbed wire on the tops. Here are some examples of those types of gates. A bollard is something that provides the illusion or appearance of a fence. These are typically posts or other components, maybe even it's shrubbery, that provides the illusion of a, of a contiguous fence. Even though there are gaps between these posts or bollards, it does provide a visual boundary for pedestrians. Next we'll take a look at lighting. A handful of details we need to understand about lighting. Of course it deters trespassers and bad guys because now they're exposed, they're visible, they're not stealthy. We want to provide lighting in all the critical areas where our employees and our customers might be, and there needs to be no dead zones or gaps, dark areas, in the areas where these pedestrians might be. I very often will combine lighting with my surveillance cameras, my closed circuit TVs. Of course, lighting needs to be carefully planned out and installed appropriately. Again, the objective is no dead zones and coverage where my users and my pedestrians uh, might need to uh, n might need to walk. Let's say from the building to the parking lot, illuminate the whole pathway, illuminate the whole parking lot. So there are a handful of issues regarding lighting that we want to consider. When we install lighting, we want to see to it that the glare from the lights don't cause problems for closed circuit TVs or for the guards that are going to be watching the areas that are illuminated. We want to have continuous lighting in all the areas where our pedestrians will be. We want to have no dark spots, no dead spots in the lighting path. We want to see to it that we're not illuminating areas we're not concerned about. So we, want, we don't want to be uh, spending money and illuminating our neighbor's property as well. Uh, the last two on this list here deals with standby lighting. Now standby lighting is where we might randomly cycle on and off lights inside a facility to provide the illusion to a bad guy that there might be people inside and therefore he probably doesn't want to break in. And then the last one here is responsive area or trip lighting and this is where we have a motion detector that flips on a light very much like we might have on the alleyway or at the garage uh, in our homes. Next we'll take a look at security guards. Now security guards are one of your best physical security components. Uh, they are also the most expensive security mechanism. But they provide a conditioned response. They interpret the situation and provide discriminating judgment. In other words, instead of a sprinkler system that floods a room uh, if, it, if there's a high temperature or smoke detected, a uh, security guard might just grab a fire extinguisher and put out a small smoldering fire uh, and of course provide substantially less water damage in this case. So we get the uh, discriminating judgment as far as the response is concerned. There are many tasks that the guards can satisfy for us in regards to physical security. They can keep an eye on the employees as they leave and make sure the employees aren't stealing our property. They can enforce regulations. Now this means they need to be trained in what our regulations are. They monitor the intrusion detection systems like the closed circuit TVs, like the PETA fences and the fire alarm systems. They can, they can walk the perimeter and make sure that doors and windows are locked and that fences and gates are, are secure. They watch for suspicious activity. At our entranceways, they, they maintain the security on piggybacking, in other words, they approve one guy to enter and they only allow one guy to enter. No, uh, no one guy swipes a card and three guys go into the facility. And we have them peruse or tour the facility to make sure that uh, all areas are, are secure and remain secure throughout the night. 
So there are pluses and there are minuses regarding security guards. The pluses, they are able to make judgments and they provide a qualified response. They interpret a little more intelligently. Uh, and again, these are our best physical security components, but they are also our most expensive physical security components. So when it comes to monitoring, again, our best uh, surveillance tech technology is a security guard. Uh, he, uh, he is quick to respond. He is uh, intelligent and can provide this conditioned response. We also could use dogs for monitoring. Uh, dogs provide early warning in that they'll sense early and start barking. They also are a good deterrent in that uh, bad guys don't want to have to deal with a guard dog. In addition to these two, we can implement closed circuit TVs. Now, closed circuit TVs simply extend the vision of the security guard because a closed circuit TV without security guards monitoring and reacting are really of not much value. Here we see different levels of the quality of closed circuit TVs. Of course, the higher the quality, the more information we're going to get, but also the more expensive these closed circuit TV devices are going to be. So we can install rudimentary closed circuit TVs for simple detection. They can identify that there's motion where there shouldn't be motion, the presence of an intruder. We can go to the next level where we might be able to identify what the intruder is doing. And finally, with the highest grade closed circuit TV, we might even be able to get a worthy enough photo of the individual, of the intruder, so that we could identify them. So let's look at these issues regarding closed circuit TVs. First, are we simply trying to identify someone is there? We're trying to identify what those what the intruder might be doing, or we're trying to actually identify the intruder. What is the purpose of the closed circuit TV? What level of quality do we need with these camera devices? What environment is this camera going to work in? If it's internal, the devices are usually less expensive because I don't have to provide all the weather-related protections versus the external cameras where I have to secure them uh, from temperature, from moisture, and even from vandalism. We want to consider the field of view that's required. How large an area is this closed circuit TV going to cover? And this will have an impact on lighting and lensing on the closed circuit TV, two issues we're going to be addressing momentarily. Uh, next is the amount of light required for this closed circuit TV. A lesser expensive CCTV will have a fixed aperture. In other words, it always requires the same amount of light. If this is an external device, that means during the day it will use sunlight for illumination, but at night I need to provide that illumination through other means. And finally, we need to recognize that these closed circuit TVs are simply one piece in this layer upon layer upon layer of security. I'll use the closed circuit TV in conjunction with security guards, intrusion detection systems, and other alarm systems. So again, I need to identify what areas do I need to cover with closed circuit TV monitoring? I need to identify the lensing type and the illumination required to provide proper video from the closed circuit TV. Here we see the basic components involved in a closed circuit TV system. We have the cameras themselves, which must be mounted properly with the proper lensing and apertures selected. We need to provide those cameras cabling and a feedback system where we can actually gain access to the information the camera is recording. Now that information is usually ch channeled through a control unit. This control unit actually uh, uh, coordinates the signals from the various cameras and then feeds that coordinated signal into a recording device which places uh, the images usually in a grid pattern so that I can on one image on a monitor view four or eight or even sixteen different areas of my facility and then with the use of a control panel I select a single area and zoom in on that in that one individual area but then roll back to the monitoring of all sixteen areas if I choose to. Again we generally want to record this information on a magnetic media such as a VCR. We talked about lensing, 
we have a fixed focal length or a variable focal length. This would uh, require um, much more sophistication on the part of the closed circuit TV lens. A fixed focal length is relatively inexpensive and simple, but again, it only gives you one area of focusing, one area where you can actually see what's going on. We also want to consider the depth of field. Now this has a, a relationship to the aperture. The greater the aperture, the narrower the depth of field. The more tight the aperture, the smaller the aperture, the greater depth of field. So I want to identify what area, what re, uh, region or range of depth is in focus. Then of course related to that aperture size has to do with the amount of light required in order to acquire an acceptable image. And then finally I need to consider the secure mounting of the closed circuit TV and of course the protection of the power line and the feedback line so that a bad guy uh, can't simply go cut the power cable and now my closed circuit TV is rendered ineffective. So here we see several examples of the types of closed circuit TVs that you might be interested in positioning around your facilities. We have external types and internal types, and then we have the multiplexing and recording gear as well as monitoring equipment. Next we'll look at intrusion detection systems and ways to secure mobile devices. Intrusion detection systems come in basically two forms. We have the electromechanical type that are cheap and fairly reliable, and we also have volumetric types that are a little more expensive and provide just a little bit more false positives than the electromechanical. The electromechanical types are magnetic switches, things like the metal foil that we put on windows, and when somebody breaks the window, it breaks the, the conductive foil and triggers the alarm. And then we also will look at pressure sensitive mats that detect when someone enters a room. The volumetric type use generally uh, either radio frequency or acoustic energy to identify motion, usually through Doppler effect. There's also the infrared type, the photoelectric type, that detects changes in heat patterns that would identify a human walking through a cool room. So intrusion detection devices can be expensive, but will only trigger an alarm. The alarm doesn't stop the bad guy from doing bad things. It requires human intervention. And here again, we, we see the need for the security guard. These intrusion detection systems generally should have redundant power supplies. If a bad guy can knock out the electricity to your building, then your intrusion detection systems and your alarms are now defeated. So they need redundant power supplies, battery backup, things along these lines. Again, they need to feed to a central security system where we have guards monitoring or we notify the police or the fire department. They should have a fail-safe configuration. In other words, if these detection devices do fail, that they don't lock in humans that might cause injury uh, to the human beings. They should be resistant to tampering and we should recognize that this is only one component in the many, many layers of security required to implement a true physical security system. One form of the electromechanical sensor is the pressure sensitive mat that, that detects uh, someone entering a, a room or a facility. We s had discussed these a little bit when we were looking at the man trap. In the man trap, they're a little bit more than just a pre pressure sensitive mat. That was uh, also specifically identifying the weight of the individual, actually a biometric measurement. Another electromechanical sensor, again, relatively inexpensive and easy to implement, is a contact sensor. This says that if a window is open, the contact is broken and the alarm goes off, or if a door is open, things along these lines. Relatively easy to install, relatively inexpensive, and fairly secure as far as the uh, false positives, fairly accurate regarding the, uh, the false positives. Other types of the closed circuit, again, uh, very much like what we, see, what we saw earlier. These are switches that detect when a door is open, a window is open, something along these lines. So the closed circuit uh, says turn off the alarm when the circuit is closed. If the circuit gets broken, sound the alarm. Now volumetric sensors are another form of intrusion detection system. These generally are either radio frequency, acoustic, or thermal, infrared, to identify motion inside the field of monitoring. 
So the radio frequency type emit a radio frequency wave. That wave reflects off of objects within the field of coverage. If there's motion in that field of coverage, a, an effect called the Doppler effect will actually change the frequency of the reflected signal. It's this change in frequency that is detected and then triggers the alarm. With the thermal, by the way, acoustic also operates in the same fashion. We send out a sound wave and that sound wave reflects off of objects. If there's motion in the field, the reflected sound wave doesn't match the transmitted sound wave due to Doppler effect and this is enough to trigger the alarm. With the infrared technology, what we see is a heat, sent, a heat pattern or a heat signature, uh, which is the byproduct of a human being being present in the uh, field of, of monitoring. Here we see the volumetric, which is a photoelectric type of sensor. This is a light beam that gets sent from transmitter to a receiver. If the light beam is broken, the alarm sounds. We see these very often in the movies as uh, bad guys are trying to break into the very sophisticated security system in a bank or some other sort of vault. The laser beam that gets broken that triggers the alarm. Acoustic and seismic. Now these are sound waves. They detect vibrations in the air. And unfortunately these have a great deal of false positives. In other words, the alarm triggers if there's a thunderbolt or if a plane flies too near, or if the garbage truck drops the dumpster too heavily. Uh, again, many false positives, the alarm goes off and it really was just a loud noise. So we have different versions of alarm systems. In one case, the alarm simply sounds locally. It makes a loud noise and hopefully will scare off the intruder. It may attract attention, but it doesn't connect necessarily to the police station, the fire department, or anything else. Basically, it's just a loud noise to startle and, and hopefully scare off the intruder. We also then have the central alarm system, which can provide a, an alarm to either the security guards that might be on site or report to the police department or fire department, etc. And then, of course, there's the proprietary alarm systems that can do all the above. Uh, generally, these are a little more expensive, a little more customized. One aspect of physical security that we need to address is securing of mobile devices. Laptops and other devices like this are stolen on a regular basis. And uh, one approach is to secure them physically, make them not mobile anymore. Uh, this is, as we see in the, in the diagram, the photograph here, we see a cable lock on a laptop. But that means now that the portability that we paid for is no longer a feature. So we always have to consider the truly portable device. These days there are products called LoJack and other sort of phone home types of technologies that can help to trace this device if it does get lost or stolen. What ha how these operate is whenever the device connects to the internet, the device reports to a server. If the laptop is lost or stolen, the owner reports it stolen to the company that provided this software and when the device actually connects to the internet again and phones home and connects to the server it reports its location based on IP address. Now unfortunately that's as good as it gets. Now the IP addresses do have a general geographic location associated with it but this certainly isn't uh, an address on a street where I can go knock on the door and say hey I'd like my laptop back. So this tracing software this uh, low jack or, or phone home type of technology isn't necessarily a guarantee you're going to get your device back. Always with mobile devices, we want to encrypt 100% of the data that lives on the hard drives, and we also want to have strong authentication. If we can implement it, multi-factor authentication should be a requirement on all these devices, as well as strong encryption for all data that is maintained on these devices. Here we see a list, a small list, of laptops that have been lost or stolen and the records, the number of private records that have been violated or compromised as a result of these, uh, these portable devices going missing. Next, we're going to look at support systems for the facilities, things that we have to protect against uh, uh, violation as well because if a bad guy can knock down my air conditioning in South Florida 
I have to close my facility. My workers will refuse to work in, in these high temperatures. And uh, so I have to protect these as well. We'll look at electrical power issues, and then finally we'll look at fire prevention, detection, and suppression. One aspect of protecting the physical security of our environment and keeping our facilities habitable is protecting our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Some considerations in this regard are that we always want to have positive air pressure into the facility so that this air that we're pushing into the facility is, has been filtered and what this does is it makes the air flow out of the building. If we have negative air pressure inside the building, in other words, I'm drawing more air out of the building than I'm putting into it, what happens is we draw contaminants into the facility and the facility will soon get polluted with dust and other, other sorts of debris. We should always document the maintenance of the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. We should know how to shut these down. Our security personnel should be first made aware that it's their responsibility to turn off the HVAC system in case of fire, and they should then be trained on where and how to do this properly. We should protect the intake vents because this would be an area where a bad guy could could uh, uh, put some sort of toxic fumes or, or gas or something even more volatile into the air conditioning system and this could proliferate through the entire facility. They should have dedicated power lines. In other words, if the power gets shut off to the building, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system should remain intact. It should stay powered. And again, uh, we had discussed the shutoff valves that uh, our security personnel should be trained as to where and how to shut this system down in the case of an emergency. Some other environmental considerations have to do with humidity. We had discussed this in a previous domain. Uh, high humidity will cause condensation and moisture building up on our electronics and this can cause corrosion and can even cause short circuiting and failure of our devices. If the humidity is too low, we build static electricity and the static discharge as we come in contact with our computers and our other electronic devices can cause failure. So the humidity should be monitored and maintained at a constant and proper humidity level. We also should control the contaminants, such as gases that could be present in the environment. With electronics, as electrons are flowing through these electronics, if, there's in, if there is a presence of gas in this area, uh, the gas combining with the electron flow can cause very quick corrosion and degradation of these electronics, causing failure. Again, this can shut down our systems. We need to be concerned about the gases that come into our facilities. Sometimes the gas is used for heating, sometimes the gas is used for cooking, various types of, of things along these lines. It, generally speaking though, uh, most of the gases that we bring into most facilities are flammable gases and we need to be sure that the gas lines are secure, tested, that they don't leak. Also we need to be sure that they're secure from uh, vandalism, from attacks. A bad guy can puncture a gas line and cause the shutdown of an entire facility, if not the destruction of the entire facility due to the gas leak. Again, they should have shutoff valves and our security personnel should be first trained that it's their responsibility to provide this shutoff service and they should be trained as to where and how to shut these gas lines down. There should be positive flow out of the building, not into it. In other words, it should be, uh, it's, there should be ventilation capabilities uh, for these, uh, any gases that might actually penetrate the building. Again, well-documented location as to where and how to shut off gas lines coming into the building. Next, we'll look at electrical power. All buildings have a primary power source. This is on the standard power grid and this is the default connectivity that you have to the power substation. This, should, this is typically our main source of power in a building. However, if we need to ensure that our systems remain active, even in the case of power failure, very often what companies should do is pull dedicated power lines from a different power substation. In case one substation fails, I can draw power from an, the alternate power substation. Another alternative on a smaller scale are UPSs, or uninter uninterruptible power supplies. There are two types, you should know them both. The first type is called the online UPS. In the online UPS, electricity flows through the battery 
into the devices, from power supply through the battery into the powered devices. In this case, with the online UPS, the switchover, in case the power fails, the battery is already connected to the devices and as a result the switchover transition is instantaneous and there generally is no spike associated with the transition from powered by the primary source to powered by the battery backup. Uh, these are typically a little more expensive and you wind up replacing those batteries a little more often because they have this continuous flow of power through them that, that actually continuous, continuously charges those batteries. But again, those batteries tend to wear out a little more rapidly. The alternate type of UPS is the standby UPS. Now this is where the power supply, the main power supply from the AC power source to the device is consistent and it's direct. However, on a trickle charge, we trickle charge the battery that runs in parallel to this AC power feed. Now, the problem with this is, if the power goes away, there is a momentary switchover process. We could have a loss of power for a brief moment, and when the battery switches in, it could introduce a spike on the line. Sometimes the interruption and or the spike can cause your computers to fail or shut down. This can cause problems. The good news with the standby UPS is they're a little less expensive and they require a little less maintenance. In other words, the trickle charging of the battery doesn't destroy the battery as readily as the, as the continuous power flow through the battery as with the online UPS. So some areas we need to uh, be concerned about regarding electrical power is we need to see to it that it's consistent and that it's clean. We don't have spikes or sags and uh, that we don't get too much noise on our AC power lines. If we do get a lot of noise on the power lines, it can actually degrade or destroy our electronic components. We need to minimize the amount of radio frequency interference and electromagnetic interference that may be introduced into these power lines. If you are experiencing unusual or erratic power in your devices, your devices sometimes reboot by themselves or, or devices fail for no explainable reason, you might want to install a power monitor, even if on a temporary basis, to monitor the AC power, identify how often you have power fluctuations, and this might indicate the need for a line conditioner. So here's some definitions you should know and understand. First is the definition of clean power, power supply that has no interference or fluctuations. EMI, electromagnetic interference, is another term you'll need to know. EMI typically implies an inconsistent fluctuation in voltage or current. This is caused by lightning, by electrical motors, or other intermittent forms of electrostatic discharge. Another term is radio frequency interference, or RFI. Now, RFI is generally considered to be a persistent or consistent radio frequency signal that introduces noise into your electrical systems. Uh, generally, the, these two, the difference between EMI and RFI is EMI is erratic, RFI is consistent. Transient noise is a form of electromagnetic interference. Again, it's a momentary interruption or spike of power. They come in many different forms. It can be induced from parallel lines. It can be a, a, a spike or surge due to lightning strikes. It can be noise from a, an electric motor of some sort. This is one form of protection for your uh, devices against electromagnetic discharge. So we should know these terms and definitions as well. High power would be a spike. A spike is a momentary high voltage situation. A surge is a prolonged high voltage situation. The concept of inrush current has to do with as we power on devices for the first one to two seconds, that device is drawing much more current than as the uh, device is maintained in a powered on state. So as again, as I power on a device, the current draw is very high for one to two seconds. After that, it stabilizes. That first one to two seconds of high amperage is called inrush current. Next, we'll look at the lower power in situations. We have the power fault. Now, a power fault is generally where one of the three prongs 
of your AC system fails. So a power fault is where one of the three wires becomes disconnected. A blackout is where we have a complete power failure. This is no electricity whatsoever, no voltage whatsoever. Power degradation and power sag imply a low voltage situation for a brief period of time. And a brownout is a low voltage situation for an extended period of time. Some things we can do to help make our electrical power more stable and steady. First, don't just pull the plug on devices. Go through a clean and orderly shutdown of those devices. Always have the ground wire, the third prong, properly grounded to earth ground. This can be tested and inspected by a qualified electrician. We need to keep our power lines away from high magnetic fields. These magnetic fields induce current flow into the power lines and can cause erratic power for our devices. This can cause failure. High voltage devices such as the ballast in fluorescent lighting can also induce this same type of electron flow through our electrical power lines causing either high voltage or low voltage situations. Again, the third prong is that ground wire and all three prongs should be connected. Don't substitute a two prong adapter when you have a three prong device. Don't run multiple power strips in a daisy chain fashion. If the wall socket has four receptacles in it, you should try to keep it to as close to that number as possible. Don't put 10 or 20 or 30 devices plugged into this socket because you'll pull too much amperage which will tend to overheat the wires. This will cause a degradation of the wires and eventually heating of the wires which will co could cause a fire or could cause damage to the devices plugged into this outlet. And then if, again, of course, don't have power lines and data lines close to devices that cause interference. We talked about this with the fluorescent lighting and the ballast and things along these lines. The device we see here is a surge suppressor. A surge suppressor knocks down spikes and high voltage situations on the electrical power. These do not have batteries and they don't provide supplemental energy. So they only provide in over voltage situations, not under voltage situations. This device is a voltage regulator. This may also be called a line conditioner. This protects against both over voltage situations and under voltage situations. They're fairly expensive and they quite often need to be repaired because they are uh, high power devices. High power tends to overheat and these devices will degrade and fail over time. Static electricity is another area of concern. One of the best things you can do to defeat static electric discharge, which can cause destruction and degradation of your devices, the best thing you can do is maintain proper humidity levels. Humidity will keep static electricity at bay. However, in the absence of these uh, humidity controlling components, you can use anti-static sprays and flooring and ensure proper grounding of devices. Next, we'll look at fire prevention, detection, and suppression technologies. Some areas of consideration regarding fire prevention are the building construction and the wiring of the facility the safety procedures we might implement regarding fire safety, training of employees, and we'll be looking at uh, practice drills so that uh, employees are well trained and know what to do, and then also some housekeeping issues so that we eliminate the types of components in our facility that could cause the fire. It should all start with a strong security policy that says what acceptable use and unacceptable use is. There are four components or four legs of a fire. Four components of every fire are heat, fuel, oxygen, and a chemical reaction. The suppressants we use to put out the fire will affect one or more of these four legs of the fire. You should know all four of them. Our fire prevention measures will either reduce the temperature, remove the fuel, disrupt the chemical reaction, or remove the oxygen from the source of the fire. The sources of fires are all over and you should, during your physical inspection of the facilities, recognize and identify these fire sources so that you have proper countermeasures in place. With fire detection, there are generally four types 
of fire detectors. You need to know all four of these. The first, and probably the most prevalent, is the ionization detector. An ion is a positive or negative, negatively charged particle or atom. Atoms, by default, have a balance of protons in the nucleus and electrons orbiting around the protons. So these are not ions. These are balanced atoms. However, in the presence of high temperature and chemical reactions, we tend to cook off or attract additional electrons, causing an imbalance in the charge. The imbalance in this charge on an atom is called an ion. Again, in the area of a fire, ions increase. And so we detect these imbalanced atoms and are, use this as our detection mechanism. These are relatively inexpensive and probably the most prevalent uh, fire detector. The next type of fire detector is a thermal detector. There are two types of thermal detectors. The first one is a fixed temperature thermal detector. This device says if the temperature ever exceeds, for example, 125 degrees, sound the alarm. That's a fixed value. The other type of thermal detector is called the rate of rise temperature sensor. It, this device says that if the temperature rises more than 10 degrees in a one minute period, sound the alarm. So again, two types of these thermal detections, fixed or rate of rise temperature sensors. The next one is called the photoelectric smoke detector. What this guy has is a light source that hits a photo detector. And when the smoke in the room fills to a point where it breaks that light beam, it sounds the alarm. And the fourth and final is the infrared detector. Now the infrared detector also uses a photoelectric cell to, to identify light, but it's not, uh, it doesn't provide its own light source. The light source that the infrared flame detector is looking for is the actual fire itself, the heat from the fire itself. You should know all four of these types of fire detectors. Where should we place fire detectors? Approximately everywhere. They should be in the drop-down ceilings, they should be in raised floors, they should be in the ventilation systems, and they should be where we have people. Looking at fire suppression agents, we have gases, we have chemicals, and we have liquids. You'll need to understand the difference between these. Halon was a very popular fire suppressant. The problem with Halon is it depletes the ozone. So the Montreal Protocol declares that Halon should no longer be used as a fire suppressant. There are a whole family of Halon replacements, one of them being FM200, another one is CO2. Carbon, uh, carbon dioxide unfortunately has the downside of killing people. So while it effectively puts out the fire, it can be detrimental to the people in the environment. Dry chemicals are not effective against electrical fires. Dry chemicals are generally used on liquid fires. Water is a good suppressant for uh, um, your standard types of fires, not based on liquids being ignited or metals being ignited but your standard combustibles. So water is a very popular suppressant for your standard combustibles. A soda acid is a, an effective suppressant for oil types of fires. This table shows the five classes of fires. You should know this table by heart when you go to take the CISSP exam. The first class of fire is called the Class A fire. The type of combustible is all common combustibles, such as wood, paper, cloth, and plastics. Again, as I indicated, water is one of the more prevalent suppressants for the Class A type of fire. Soda acid is used if the fire is based on perhaps cooking oil or something along those lines. Soda acid is very often used for this. Soda acid can also be used in the fire ex extinguishers. A Class B fire is a liquid fire. These are flammable liquids such as petroleum, tars, oil, solvents, alcohol, and very often the most popular suppressant for these are gases. We see CO2 and FM200 both being suppressants for the Class B type of fire. Again, these are both gases. One of them, of course, CO2 is hazardous to humans, and FM200 is an approved halon replacement. 
you wouldn't want to put liquid on a liquid fire because you'll cause the fire to flow to other areas and you'll ignite other types of combustibles. The third type of fire is the Class C fire. This is an electrical fire. With electrical fire, the first thing we want to do is shut down the power to the, to the area of ignition. The second thing I want to do is put a gas on this as a suppressant. So again, I'll use either a halon, a halon replacement, or I'll use CO2 if I can uh, use the CO2 in the area. Again, remember, CO2 is hazardous to humans. The fourth type of fire is a Class D. The Class D is combustible metals. Now, the problem with combustible metals is they burn at very high temperatures. If you put water on a metal fire, what you'll find is in what you'll get is in a steam explosion and you'll cause more damage than the fire alone. The best way to put out a class D fire is with dry chemicals. These would be the powders. These tend to be fairly exotic and specialized. The good news is we don't generally have combustible metals in the home and in, in most of our companies. We don't have to deal with these materials, so we don't need to be too worried about the exotic suppressants required to put them out but you should know that a Class D fire is a combustible metal and it requires dry chemicals to put it out. And finally, the fifth is called the Class K. This is a kitchen fire and this is a combination of the common combustibles along with a, a cooking oil fire. And uh, so we can use water on the common combustibles and on the cooking oil we would use the soda acid to put this out. Earlier, I indicated the need for emergency power shutoff switches and that our security personnel should be trained that it is their responsibility to throw this switch in case of emergency and also be trained on where and how to turn off this power in the emergency situation. We have a special need in addition to that in the data center. Of course the data center is heavily reliant on power. There's generally a great deal of electricity in the area to power all the devices and so generally we'll want an emergency power shutoff switch located in the data center. Again, we should have our personnel trained on how to shut off the power in case of emergency and that is, it is their responsibility to do this in the case of specified emergencies. Employees should also be trained on where fire extinguishers are located, how to use those fire extinguishers, and what the proper suppressant agent is. In other words, you can use this type of extinguisher on this type of fire. This should all be uh, part of your employee awareness training for the security program. Next, we're going to look at sprinkler systems. There are four types of sprinkler systems that you need to know for the CISSP certification exam. The first type of uh, sprinkler system is called the wet pipe. Now the wet pipe sprinkler system is where the water flows all the way up to the discharge head, generally located in the ceiling. And the problem with this is if the area is not thermally controlled, the water in these pipes can freeze and break. So within the, the building itself, wet pipe is a very popular form of sprinkler system because the water is there already and it makes for a very fast reaction. The problem though again occurs if the area is not thermally controlled such as a garage or some other area like this, a warehouse, if these pipes freeze the water expands and breaks the pipes and we have water, then, water damage over the area. Again the wet pipe is the most commonly used and it's probably the least expensive. The second type of sprinkler system you need to understand is called the dry pipe. The dry pipe has the same sprinkler system going, being distributed throughout the facility. However, the water doesn't fill the pipe. The water is actually uh, contained, in a shut, uh, contained by a shutoff valve that is away from the sprinkler head itself. Now, this does a couple things. First, we would place the shutoff valve in a thermally stable area so that the pipe that might be in a, a non-thermally controlled area does not contain water and therefore if it gets very very cold there's nothing inside to freeze, there's no expansion and there's no breaking of the pipes. The problem with the dry pipe though is there is a delay in the time that the alarm sounds then the valve opens, we now have to fill the pipe and that's when the sprinkler heads finally release the water. So the dry pipe uh, protects against frozen pipes 
but has a built-in delay from the time an alarm sounds until the water actually starts to penetrate the area where we're trying to put out the fire. The next type of sprinkler system is called the pre-action system. Now the pre-action system is generally considered to be a combination of the wet pipe and a dry pipe. Generally speaking, we have a dry pipe implementation where a valve is in a thermally controlled area away from the sprinkler heads. And the sprinkler heads additionally have a plastic billet that actually is the plug for the sprinkler. These plastic billets are specially configured or designed so that they melt at a specified temperature. That temperature specification is generally part of the uh, ordinances, the fire regulations for your particular area. So again, we have the dry pipe situation with a, a plastic billet at the sprinkler head and only uh, when the alarm sounds, the pipes fill, and then after the billet gets melted due to a specific temperature in the room, that's when the billet melts and releases water in that particular area. Now the pre-action system is good in minimizing the amount of collateral damage that occurs when the alarm sounds. Only the areas that are exposed to high temperature will have the water damage. So the pre-action system is a little more expensive. Again, it has built-in delays, but it also has something like a conditioned response. The fourth and final sprinkler system you need to understand is called the deluge system. The deluge system is where the sprinkler head is already wide open. There's a large volume of water located uh, somewhere in the facility. Generally, it's high, like on the roof of the, of the building. And when the alarm sounds, the valve opens, floods all the pipes, all the, all the sprinkler heads are already open. So this is very fast to react, very high volume of water, very high water damage. But at the same time, we would use the deluge systems where I have to ensure that I put the, the fire out as rapidly as possible. Uh, this is commonly used where we have a lot of flammable goods that if these flammable goods uh, catch on fire, I may never get the fire put out until total destruction occurs. Some rules about fire extinguishers. Again, we had already discussed that your users should be trained on where the fire extinguishers are located and the proper suppressant types for the proper types of fires. In addition, the fire extinguishers should always be within 50 feet of any electrical equipment. That would be a great thing to know for the exam. They should be in inspected at least quarterly. That's four times a year. They should be clearly marked with the uh, identifiers of the proper types of fires and the proper, uh, the, the suppressant that's contained within the fire extinguishers. They should be easily reached and easily accessed and again filled with the appropriate and approved suppression agent for the type of fire that the extinguisher is in the proximity of. Your users should be trained in emergency procedures. These procedures should be documented, readily available, and it should be a requirement of all employees that they read and understand these emergency procedures. Again, uh, complete with training and drills. Regarding tests and drills, we need to have everyone in the organization well aware of what is expected of them in the emergency situation. They should know what they need to do. They should know how to evacuate and how to react. In other words, who to contact and what, uh, what they should be doing in case of the emergency. These drills should be run at least once a year. We should always review and make sure that our plan is updated and is current because the facility changes. We add a new wing or we remove an area of the building. Uh, so all these should be reviewed and tested at least once a year. In addition to fire detection suppressants and prevention, we also should have water detectors to identify water damage in case of a broken pipe or a sprinkler system uh, that, that fails. So these can also help to minimize the amount of damage in case of some sort of water leakage. They should be placed under raised floors, placed in the drop down ceilings. Uh, again, very similar to smoke detectors, where do you place these? Approximately everywhere. All these things we've considered need to be put together in a cohesive plan so that they operate in a synergistic manner. 